Good morning, everyone. Uh, so this is the last day of EuroPython, and in this session, we are actually dealing with some of the very hot topics uh, that I'm really interested in. Uh, that's neural networks and deep learning. And to begin with, we have our first speaker, T. Rashid. Uh, he'll give a talk on a gentle introduction to neural networks. So please give a big round of applause. Hello, hiya, can you hear me, does this work? Yeah, cool. Right, first of all, thank you very much for um, coming to uh, my talk. Um, for me, it's really great to be at um, an open community, open source conference. I always learn a lot, actually. Um, I always have great conversations. And there's always a very generous spirit, so I want to thank everyone and also the organizers, so nice one. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, uh, neural networks, and I just want to be really clear um, my talk is very um, uh, intended to be very introductory. It's, um, it's for people who perhaps don't know what neural networks are or how they work, uh, or maybe you studied them a long time ago and forgotten. So uh, if you already know what they are, if you're already an expert, you might be bored, so I don't mind if you, if you want to go to another talk. Cool. <laughs> um, my name's Tariq Rashid, I forgot to say that. Um, I'm one of the co-organizers of London Python. Um, and if you want to come and do something with us, um, please come along and have a chat with me. We really want to do more sort of broad things, everything from computer art to um, teaching people to code. Right. Cool. So, um, as I said, this is an introductory talk. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the background of what is artificial intelligence, why is there a lot of interest in neural networks at the moment. Um, then we'll get into the ideas, and that's the, the meat of this talk, really. It's what are the concepts that uh, are used um, in neural networks, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll use some very simple, kind of naughty examples, which, which may not seem that interesting, but they illustrate the very key points that make neural networks work, so I hope that you'll stick with them, um, and that will help us understand what's going on inside a neural network. Um, we'll also apply them. Um, I'll give you an example of applying neural networks to quite an interesting um, um, challenge, recognizing handwritten numbers. Um, I'll give some pointers around how you might code your own. Um, and I might regret this. <laughs> I'll do a live demo at the end, um, and if it goes wrong, that's gonna be really embarrassing, but <laughs> we'll give it a go. Um, I'm not gonna talk about um, libraries. Um, there's lots of cool stuff out there. There's Theano, there's TensorFlow, um, and there's, there'll be lots of talks today um, um, covering things like that. So mine is really about the concepts, what's really going on, and how you might do your own. So just to get us into um, the kind of the right frame of mind, um, I'm gonna start with two questions. So I have a seven-year-old daughter, and, I, and she likes challenges. So I set her this challenge, I said, can you look at this picture and point out where the people are? And, and as a seven-year-old child, she found that quite exciting, very easy. They look like seven-year-old children. And she counted the, 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 the people in the picture, and that was, that was fine. Um, she, she can do numbers, she can add, she can subtract. So I sort of said to her, can you add those numbers? And, and she found that very difficult. Um, but you know um, that with coding, with computers, with Python, um, doing a calculation such as that one on the right is actually very easy, but instructing a computer to find people in a photo is not so easy. So that's interesting. That's easy for us, and that's easy to code for computers, but that's hard to code for computers, and that's easy. So there's something there, and we would like to be able to solve these kinds of problems, because they're interesting, you know, find me a picture of a cat, um, work out what this sound sample, what the words are in this sort of audio file. You know, th those are really interesting problems, um, and we want to be able to solve more of them. And, you know, the terminology like artificial intelligence, it means different things to different people. So for me, it means being able to solve the kinds of problems that traditionally have not been um, that straightforward. So that's what, that's what this is about. And there's a lot of hype at the moment, there's a lot of buzz, there's lots of um, stuff going on that you, you, know, you won't have missed. There's autonomous cars, there's health data being used to improve um, um, uh, outcomes. 
Um, Google's been uh, very kind of um, active recently with um, you know, being able to play Go, which, which is amazing. We thought that it would take another sort of 20 years. Uh, and they use you know, neural networks as part of their solution. So that, that, that's, you know, it, it interests people. Um, and that's what we'll talk about today. So let's go right back to the beginning, you know, really, really assuming nothing. So we want to ask a computer a question and we want an answer and it's going to do some kind of thinking. Well, clearly you can't think, it's, uh, it's just um, you know, metal and wires. Um, so it has to calculate, you know, that's, it has to process. And those are words I guess programmers like ourselves uh, understand. We have input, we have some kind of calculation, and we have output. And neural networks and artificial intelligence, that's, that's all it is. There's nothing mysterious about it. It's just calculations. Just cleverly done. <laughs> so let's, let's set ourselves a very, very simple example just to get started. Um, imagine that the conversion from kilometers to miles is a difficult problem. Just imagine. I know it's not. You know it's not, but let's just imagine it is. And imagine we didn't know how to do it. So we invent a model in our mind. We sort of say, maybe one is the other one multiplied by a number. That's a model. We've kind of come up with a model. We think it might be right. We might be wrong. We're going to try it. Um, let's start with a, um, a number. We don't know. Um, it, it could be miles is kilometers times 100, or miles is kilometers times 2. Let's start with a number. We'll start with 0.5. And if we compare it with um, you know, real examples of truth, uh, we know it should be 62.137, but our model um, calculated 50. It's not that bad. Um, there's an error of 12. It's okay, it's not great. Um, let's, let's tweak that, 0.6. That gives a better um, um, answer. Still not exactly right, but the error is much smaller now. Um, let's try again, 0.7. We've, we've gone too far, and it's much worse now. Let's, let's not be so enthusiastic about jumping and try 0.61. And that's actually getting quite close. So this, this idea of using a model and tweaking a parameter inside it and then comparing the output with, with what we know should be true is how neural networks work and many other, actually, machine learning methods. We use the error that pops out the other end and use that to kind of tweak and guide the refinement of a parameter inside the model. I hope that's clear and that's a super easy example, but that's what a neural network is doing. If you just replace that circle with a neural network, that's really what's happening. You're training it, you're looking at the error and you're tweaking parameters inside it to try and get a better answer at the other end. We can go home now, that's it. <laughs> um, Okay, so there's the key points there. You know, if we don't know how something really works, um, you know, we, 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 we haven't got an exact mathematical model, uh, we, can invent, we, can, we can come up with a model that we think might be true and we can try it and we can have parameters that we can adjust. And the important point there is the error is used to refine the, the model. So let's, let's take our daughter into the garden where she likes to pick up bugs. Um, and she's picked up some um, caterpillars and ladybirds. And imagine that we've plotted them on a graph with width and length. So caterpillars are thin and long, and ladybirds are short and wide. And if we plot them, we can see there's two clusters, two groups there, which is interesting. And some of you will recognize this as clustering. That's, 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 that's cool. What we did first with our first example was have a linear um, line, a predictor, um, the relationship between kilometers and miles we, we thought was a straight line with, and we changed the parameter, we changed the slope. What we're going to try and do here is see if we can apply that same simple model and see if we can come up with a way of predicting or classifying um, what a bug should be. So that line, instead of being a prediction line, it could be a separating line. So things on one side of the line are one type of object, caterpillars. Things on the other side of the line might be um, um, the ladybirds. That's not a good one because that doesn't separate the two kinds of bugs. This one doesn't either. And that one does. So you can see that learning to classify is not that different 
from the very first simple example we looked at. And, the, and you can also see through this kind of <laughs> naive animation that we're changing the slope is a way of um, learning to find a good separation line between those two clusters. So once we've, if we've learned that line, if we've learned a good separating line, if we then find an unknown bug, you can say, well, that's, that falls in that half of the, of the space, so it must be a caterpillar. So classifying things, is, it's kind of like predicting things. So we apply these methods um, when we don't really know what the model should be, but what we do have is real data, so we learn from data. We invent a model, we think it's a good one, and we try to refine it um, to match the data that we've collected. It might be you know, data from space, you know, the microwave background radiation, which we heard about earlier in the week. It might be voice data, it might be a sentiment. Uh, we're gonna stick with a super, super simple data set consisting of two items, <laughs> um, um, just the widths and lengths of, of two bugs. And here we are, we're plotting them. So we start again with um, a, a randomly chosen um, parameter for that line, a randomly chosen gradient, and we say, okay, that's not, um, that's not good because it doesn't separate the two lines. So let's look at the first example there, and we need to shift the line up to that point. Okay, we've improved it, that, that kind of does a good job. Now let's, what could we learn from the second example? Well, we, we, we look at the second example and we say, all right, the separator must keep that example on that side of the line. Um, and that kind of works. And if you're interested in the maths, it's really simple. We, we've got straight lines. Uh, it's very sort of simple linear algebra. You can rearrange the uh, terms to work out what the change in gradient should be if you want to um, get the line to go through a certain point. But actually, we've made um, um, a kind of a mistake here because what we've done is we've looked at an example and ignored all the previous ones before it. And we don't want to do that. We want to learn from all the data, not just the last one we looked at. If we did this, we would work through all the examples and we just um, have an answer which you could have got by looking at the last example. So one way of doing that is actually not to be so enthusiastic about your, um, the amounts that you jump up by. What you, what you can do is you can say, instead of jumping forward or changing the line by you know, five, we apply a, a factor, like a learning rate, so we only jump a little bit. So if, if the first example wants me to go over there, I just move in that direction a little bit. If the next example wants me to go over there, I move a little bit. So with lots of data, you can see that you eventually get better and better but you're not overly influenced by each, uh, any individual data point. And that's good because uh, data is noisy and there can be outliers, there can be errors in the data, and you don't want to you know, over, give too much importance to any one individual data point. And that learning rate is, um, is quite an important um, um, idea in neural networks, and we'll, we'll understand why in a minute. So let's um, um, increase the, um, dial up the complexity a little bit. So imagine we have data which is um, uh, something to do with the real world and it's causal. So maybe I'm measuring the amount of smiling in this room and the other factors I'm measuring are whether it's sunny and whether it's the weekend. So you can see if it's sunny and it's the weekend, there might be more smiles. Or if the sun's shining and there's no cloud, the temperature might go up. You can see that in, in the real physical world, data can have causal links um, and we want to be able to model that. I mean, that, that would be a great thing to do, to model and um, be able to predict or classify a data that comes from the real world. So here's some simple examples here. Um, you know, we have um, the Boolean relations, we have um, the and relation and the or relation, if two conditions are true, and the third one is, um, you know, the, 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 the and is only true if the both inputs are true. Um, so some data can be like this. Um, can, we, can we model that with the very simple example, the simple classifier that we've got? Just to say, actually, um, that, that thing we did at the start with the picture, there's nothing wrong with having two inputs into a calculation. 
that, that's okay. So we can visualize um, um, that, that, that data by saying, you know, we, we can plot the sort of, you know, the, the two inputs as coordinates, and we can say the output is colored. So if we have an AND relationship, we color it green if, it's, if they're both on. And yes, the dividing line still works. We can still have a linear classifier to separate off data which has a sort of an AND um, kind of causal uh, link in there. And the same with OR. So that's cool. We could use that very simple, very kind of naive um, classifier to learn data which has the AND um, kind of cause in it or, or a logical OR in it. So that, that's cool. That's, that's, that's looking hopeful. But actually, in history, um, I think it was probably in the 70s, um, people sort of um, became sad because somebody wrote a paper that said, actually, these simple classifiers are very limited. Um, and it's because um, those simple classifiers, the linear classifiers, uh, can't learn data which has the XOR relationship. So if I have two variables which are related um, to the answer with an XOR, they're only true if either of the inputs are true, but not both. Can't do that, and you can see why. You can see visually, no line um, correctly separates those two classes. So, so that led to a bit of, um, um, I guess, a bit of a, a slowdown in, in research in neural networks. Um, but if you look at this, you think, well, the answer's kind of there already. We have two lines. <laughs> um, and this is an important point, actually. I know this is a very simple example. But what this suggests to us is that actually we need more than one of those classifiers to help us with data that's more complex. And that is actually why neural networks have many, many nodes rather than just one node. And that's, 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 I think that's an, uh, an important point there. So some problems can't be solved with just a simple linear classifier. We kind of know that. Um, but it's the motivation for why we might want to explore using multiple nodes. Let's sh take a shift a little bit and look at um, um, nature again. We started right at the start with the example of my daughter's brain being able to uh, find uh, people in a photograph, but me not being able to code that very easily. So human brains are doing something and working in a way that's different from my kind of you know, laptop here wants to work. And it's, you know, throughout history, people have tried to understand what is it about the way biological brains work that makes them so good? What can we learn from that and replicate in new kinds of algorithms? And actually, you know, just, just to have a look, um, you know, this computer's got, what is it, 16 gig of RAM and how many mega kind of instructions per second. It's, it's quite, um, quite chunky. And yet, a pigeon, which has a brain of 0.4 grams, um, it can fly, it can learn to eat, it can communicate, um, it, it can learn to do new tasks. That's really important. Um, a snail's got 11,000 neurons. That's not a lot, really. You know, we, we can store sort of, you know, with big data technologies, kind of huge amounts of um, data structures, and we, these things have just 11,000. This, this worm has 302 neurons. You know, I'm sure I can fit that in a, in a micro bit. Um, <laughs> um, th this is interesting. Um, there is a species of, um, of, of, of whale um, which has 37 billion neurons but we humans have 20, and it's using them because if it wasn't using them, it would have evolved away because it's a cost. It makes you think that maybe we're not the most um, uh, superior things on the planet. <laughs> but anyway, the, the point here is that um, nature's doing something with, with brains that we can learn from, and you know, which, with apparently such small resources, they're able to do tasks which we think are quite complicated. So those neurons that, um, that, that biologists um, know are inside our brains and our nervous systems, if we look at them, what they do is they kind of transmit a signal along um, onto another one. Um, those are the, just the, 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 kind of the names for the various elements. But what they don't do is they don't sort of pass a signal on 
un kind of, you know, without any um, kind of resistance, what they do is they only pass a signal on once that signal is kind of past a threshold. It's like turning up a dial and the light only goes on after I've reached a certain kind of number. Um, so maybe our computing neurons that we model, maybe they should do the same. And some people will think, oh, I could use a step function to do that. So if the input is past a certain point, then it switches on. Um, actually, yeah, you could do that. Um, but in nature, we know that things aren't always sort of black and white and hard edged. Things are softer. Um, so we, we might try a softer um, kind of function. We, that's a sigmoid function. Um, there are others that you could use. And we know in nature these things are connected, like sort of a network, a mesh, and you can see the signals going along. So maybe that's what we should try and model uh, when we want to do some interesting um, tasks like recognizing pictures. And again, going back to that thing we saw right at the start, there's nothing wrong with having more than one input coming into um, a computing kind of node. Um, and what we've just said here is that we're collecting the inputs just as they do in, in, the, in, in nature. And we're going to apply a threshold function so that we only have an output if that combination is big enough. And that becomes our node in a neural network. So after how many minutes of talking? Oh my God, I'm running out of time. <laughs> We've finally got a neural network. That's all it is, a network, a neural network, an artificial neural network, is our attempt to try and recreate uh, what those biological brains are doing. And each of those circles is doing what we saw here, collecting the signals, applying the threshold function, and passing on the output. Um, it is convention that we call these layers. We have a middle layer, we have an input layer, we have an output layer, um, and there we have some connections. So let's pause a little bit and think, with our very, very first example, where we wanted to convert miles to kilometers, we had a straight line with an adjustable slope, a parameter. That's what did the learning. The learning was the changing of that slope, that, that kind of multiplication factor. What's learning in a neural network? What do we change? What do we need to tweak so that the outputs are better? There's probably lots of answers to that. You might say that function, that threshold function, that curve, maybe we need to change the slope of that in each of those nodes. That's, that's probably, you know, that's, that's not a bad idea. Um, actually, what, where history has taken us, what people do, is adjust the links, the strength of the links between those um, nodes. So if, if a link is strong, a signal is amplified. If a link is weak, it is kind of reduced. Uh, if a link is zero, uh, effect, if the weight, if the strength is zero, you effectively break, break a link. So that's, that's one approach, and that's the one that's become um, popular, probably because it's easier as well. So when we feed signals forward, let's just imagine we've got signal one at the top there, and we have a, a link there, go call between one and one, and you can see it's got a, a weight, um, a strength of 0.9. What we would do is take that signal one, multiply by 0.9, and that's what feeds into the next node. Same here, 0.5 times 0.3 is what would go up there. That's really easy, that's, that's not complicated at all. Um, that's, that's what is happening inside a neural network. Just multipli multiplying signals through connections and feeding them onto the next uh, node and collecting them. That's just a reminder of what we're doing. We've got the signals coming in, we add them up, but this time you can see that we're weighting them. We're using the weights of those links to kind of either boost or reduce those signals. I've colored them there so you can see. You can see the slides afterwards, you don't have to do the calculation now, but you, you know, you can, if you want to, you can verify that you know, that times that plus that times that would give you that answer. And that's, that really is as simple as, 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 as it gets, and that's what a neural network is doing. There's nothing, nothing very complicated there at all. So we had a very simple network here with just um, you know, four nodes. If we wrote out with a pen and paper what is happening at each node. So 
at that node number one in layer two, if we wrote out what's actually happening, we'd say it's the input one times that weight plus the input two times that weight. And if we wrote it out for this one, and we wrote it out again for all the nodes, you start to see a pattern. And that pattern's really helpful because that allows us to write that calculation as a matrix multiplication. So the weights matrix times the input signals becomes the um, signals that go into the next um, 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 layer. And that's really, really valuable to us because, for two reasons, it allows us to write that calculation in a much more concise way so we don't have to write pages and pages for big networks. We just write weight times input is the, the signal into the next layer. The other reason that's really important is because computers, NumPy, um, can accelerate matrix multiplications and we want to take advantage of that. Whether it's NumPy, whether it's Fortran libraries we heard about earlier, whether it's hardware acceleration, so using your graphics card to multiply matrices. Um, if we can formulate our calculations in terms of matrices, then we can take advantage of the acceleration that's possible. So you might say, oh man, matrices are so boring. Why would we have to do this again? But, but this is the reason. So that's cool. We're kind of feeding a signal forward through each layer of the network and we get an answer at the other end. We know that actually we're likely to be wrong just like we were at the start. So we have an error. And going back to that very first example again, we use that error to refine and improve the um, parameters inside the model. How do we do that here? So let's break it down. Let's, let's kind of have a simple network here, a simple picture, just to see what might happen. Well, we know that we need to change the weights. That we've, we've already agreed that we're going to change those, um, the strength of those links in order to try and improve the answer. That's what we're playing with. That's the parameter that we're tuning. Um, we, what's, the, what's the error? Um, we know what the error is right at the end of the network. If the answer should be five and we get three, the error is two. But what's the error inside the network? Because we, we need to know the error in order to change the, the weights. So that's, that's quite um, an interesting question. Um, and actually, lots of, lots of the guides and the books kind of gloss over that a little bit. Um, what we could do is, well, actually, the first thing to say is that there's probably no kind of um, a mathematically kind of perfect answer. So what we, we do is we kind of think, the word is heuristics. We think, well, what would, what would be a, an intuitive way of working out the error inside the network? And one intuitive idea is to say, let's split it. So if the error is five, maybe I push two and a half this way and two and a half that way. That's an idea. Um, another idea is to say that top link three with the weight three contributed more to the error because it was a bigger, stronger link. It magnified the signal. Maybe I should put more error in that direction. So you split the error proportionate to the links. So if, if I've got um, weights of three and one, so the, the links of strength three and three and one, you can see three quarters of the error would go to the top node and a quarter would go this way. That kind of makes sense. Um, I'm sure there's more sophisticated things you can do, but we want to keep it simple, <laughs> especially if it works. So you can see there actually that um, the error from that node um, is, is being kind of split and pushed back. Um, and the same here. And the internal nodes, you would actually collect uh, the several fractions of error that, you, that, that link to it. Sounds complicated, but when you see it as a picture, you can see the errors flowing backwards. Back propagation of the error, that's where the term comes from, error back propagation. So feeding forward signals and back propagating errors. Oh, it's too many calculations. You can be good at it afterwards. <laughs> the point here is that you're summing up the error. So if the error is 0.6 from that top right, and this one's contributing 0.1, the error is then 0.7. So 0.6 plus 0.1, you just collected the errors. And again, it's really nice, really fortunate that if we did write out what, what's really happening in, in terms of you know, variables, um, 
we, it becomes a matrix multiplication again, which is really nice because we can accelerate that and we can write it in a very concise way without worrying about the actual size of the network. It's only slightly different because the weights matrix is then transposed, it's flipped um, diagonally. But again, it's super, super simple. Okay, so we've got the errors now at each node. How do we, <laughs> how do we, how do we change the weights? Okay, um, so that's the output, uh, one of the output nodes. Those Ws are the weights of those links inside. Um, I'm not gonna be able to untangle that. If you can, you know, well done. Um, that's horrible. So what we need to do here is to say, we're not gonna be able to kind of untangle that in any kind of nice mathematically clean way. Let's find other mathematical methods which are perhaps approximate but good enough. So let's go on a bit of a journey. <laughs> Imagine this landscape is a complicated function like that one we saw. Um, and if it's say an error function, um, because that, that what we had here is the output, and the error function is simply that um, minus what the, what the actual target should be. Um, if this horrible, complicated, lumpy landscape is, is a really complicated function, which we can't work out analytically, you know, with nice clean algebra, another way to kind of work with it and maybe work out the minimum, where the minimum error is, is to sort of say, well, if this was a landscape, and I didn't have a map of everything, um, and it was dark, I, I couldn't understand the whole function, uh, but I did have a torch, what I could do is I could point the torch um, down near my feet and say, well, the, its slope is going in this direction, take a few steps, it's going in that direction, take a few steps, and eventually um, you would work your way down to a minimum. Um, some of you will put your hands up and say, it might not be the best minimum, but we'll come to that. So this, this approach, which is not mathematically kind of clean, um, it's an approximate method, but it works really well. Um, and you can see it working really well with, um, you know, let's pretend the x squared function is really difficult, let's just pretend that. Uh, you can say that, you know, we start at a point, and we see where the gradient is locally, and we kind of move in that direction, and we keep doing that, and you'll get to the minimum, um, which, which works, and that's, that's kind of nice. And you might even be more sophisticated and say, as the slope gets smaller, you might take smaller steps because you're getting closer and closer to the real minimum and you don't want to overstep it. That's an idea that's actually used in neural networks as well. So if that, if that error, if that complicated function um, was the error function, then we have a way of finding, actually I have a picture to show you, there it is. So if we have the weight, which is what we want to um, kind of improve, and we have an error function which is complicated, we want to use this gradient descent method to find um, the minimum of that error, and we'll then know what the right weight should be. So if we're over here with the wrong weight, we're gonna have high error, and we're gonna try and say, okay, I want to improve my position and move down the error function to somewhere where the error is smaller and then the weights there will tell me what the right weights in that network should be. So this is called gradient descent and it's a way of working with that horrible kind of um, uh, expression that we couldn't kind of do analytically before. If you did write this out again with pen and paper um, and, and worked out sort of the gradient locally, it's not that hard, I mean I won't do it here, I have a blog post if you want to look. It's very simple calculus. It's the kind of calculus you would do at school, just using the chain rule. Um, nothing more complicated than that. So if you are interested, you know, have a look. There's, a, there's a, what I hope is a very clear kind of blog post on that. So what we've, what we've done now is we've, we've, we've worked out a way of improving the weights based on the gradient of that error function and you know, you've seen this kind of expression many times where we iterate and keep improving. Okay, um, I've only got um, a, a bit of time left, so I'm gonna zoom through um, um, sort of how you might do it yourself. Um, I'm not an expert Python coder. Um, um, there's 
people here who are. Um, but broadly speaking, you know, if you wanted to do this yourself, you might think, what would a Python kind of you know, program or class look like? Well, we've, we know we've got to initialize this data structure, this network, um, and it's really simple. You know, all we're having to really do is set the size and initialize those weights to random initial values. Uh, we know that we've got to have some way of training the network, so we're doing the learning. And then we've got to have a, a way, a method of querying the network, so we ask it a question and get an answer back. And it's, you know, you, if you go on to make your own kind of neural network library or class, it doesn't have to be more complicated than this at all. Um, I had to go, you know, just for fun to learn. Um, and there's some very useful kind of Python um, libraries. NumPy is great for matrix uh, multiplications, um, as you've heard all this week. <laughs> uh, SciPy's got some nice um, um, functions in there for doing, um, like that that's curved equation, that curved graph, the uh, threshold function. It's got that built in, so you can you can use that yourself. Um, plotting things is Matplotlib. You can use other things. Um, I started programming um, a long time ago, and then I stopped. So I was coding Python in 1999, I think, 98. Python 1.5, 1.6, numeric library rather than NumPy. Anyway, so notebooks didn't exist then, so I came back to Python and notebooks are fantastic, They're excellent. So this, this is um, a, an example of a function which initializes the network. Um, it looks complicated, um, don't be put off. All it's really doing is setting the size in terms of the input nodes, the hidden nodes, the, the output nodes. And you can see here I'm using a NumPy function to randomize um, do the weights, which are a matrix. That's it, nothing more complicated than that. Although you can see the SciPy function there as well. XBit, I don't know why it's called XBit, but that's the logistic function, the curve. We'll do the training next, but querying's again, really easy. We take the inputs, um, I've turned them into an array. Um, it was a list here. Um, we can see that there's a matrix multiplication, numpy dot dot, to do the, the calculation. And that's it. We apply the activation function to the outputs of that multiplication. Simple as that. You've then got the uh, signal at the next layer, and then you do it again. That's it. It's as simple as four lines. Propagating the signal through a neural network is simple as that. I'm sure I could make it you know, even more concise, but <laughs> um, I just want to let you know, really, by doing this, that that it's not mysterious or scary or complicated. It really is as simple as just that. And the training, again, it, whoa, it looks scary, but it isn't really. The top half is exactly the same as what we've just had. We're feeding the signals forward and exactly the same code as before. And then what we're doing is we're saying the output errors is a target, which is from our training data, minus what we've, what we've worked out, and then we use another set of matrix multiplications to work out the, um, the errors internally to the network, and then we change the weights using that expression that we worked out with calculus. That's it. That's how you train a neural network. I'm sure I can make it even more beautiful and clean, but I just wanted you to kind of get the feel for what's really going on in a network, and it's not that complicated. You could do it yourself. Okay, with a few minutes left, um, I'm just going to sort of show you that with just those very simple ideas that we looked at, I mean, you know, people will have many more kind of, you know, sophisticated methods and optimizations, and you can read quite a lot about neural networks, but just with the very, very simple ideas that we've looked at, you can do some powerful things. So we can train a network to learn to recognize human handwritten numbers. There's a famous challenge, a data set called the MNIST data set. Um, it's got 60,000 um, training examples. Um, it's all free open data, you can get it yourself. Um, if you want to look at my blog, you, you can point you to it. Um, and there's um, a test set as well. And you can compare your results with others. If I looked at the data, you'll see the numbers there. Actually, if you plot that as an image, you know, using, uh, what did I use, matplotlib, you can see that's, that's a five, 28 by 28 pixels. So if we feed those, um, that data into a network and train it, um, Actually, um, I, I missed something there. We have to choose what the output looks like. Um, what I've chosen is to say we have 10 nodes at the output, 
Um, and if the answer should be, say, nine, the ninth one has the biggest value. So you can see here, if, the, if, if it's five, then it's the fifth node that should be of a high value and everything else should be low. That's what I'm using to train the network. That last example is interesting because in this one, the network thinks the answer is probably nine, but it might also be four. <laughs> um, and and you, you, know, you, you, you can get some really good results just with those simple ideas. 96% accuracy is what I got with my first go. That's not bad, you know, sort of 20 lines of code and, you know, handwritten human, you know, numbers, and you can get, you know, over 90% accuracy. That's, 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 that's not bad at all, is it? I think. Uh, and if you ever play, you can, you can tune things like the learning rate or the number of hidden nodes, and you can see that you can get improved performance, and then it might not improve so much. I've deliberately put in um, um, a bit of a wonky graph there just to remind us that neural network training is a random process. We're starting off with random initial weights, and sometimes it can go wrong. And that's, for the scientists among us, it reminds us that um, uh, we should do this many, many times and take the best or, or to make sure that we've not got an, an, an anomalous kind of answer. Uh, remember that gradient descent before, you might end up at the wrong minimum, not the best minimum. So it's worth doing this many times. If you rotate your um, um, uh, original data set, you can get 98% accuracy. This is actually really um, good because it, if you look at the academic papers, they get sort of, you know, 99%, 99.5%, but they're using really advanced techniques. And I think, you know, with just 20 lines of code, that's not bad. <laughs> I'll just skip this, and what I'll do now is, um, I'll just say you can actually do this with a Raspberry Pi Zero. Everything I've done, um, you can look at the blog as well. You can do with a uh, Raspberry Pi Zero, which costs about four or five euros. Um, you don't need an NVIDIA graphics card to do any of this. So in the last few minutes, I'm going to try and do a live demo, and I might, uh, <laughs> I might regret it. So let's think of a number to classify. Let's, let's um, think of a number. Seven. Okay, it has to be one digit. That's seven. Let's write it. Here's one I did earlier, actually, from a newspaper. So that's the number two, and it got that right. This is a network of trains last night. So let's, uh, oops. Okay, all right, let's three. If it doesn't work, it's not my fault. <laughs> okay, let's resize that to 28 by 28. Let's save that. PNG. All this code is on GitHub if you want to have an explore. All right. If I press go, let's see. Three. The yeah, network says three. Phew. <laughs> Phew. <laughs> I did a few last night and it didn't work every time. <laughs> Phew. Um, I'll stop there. Um, um, I'd love to have a chat about this afterwards. Um, I don't know how much time I've got left for questions. Um, do I have any or did I use it all up? Okay, all right, yeah, go for that. Thanks for listening, by the way, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>Hi. Hello. Uh, so we have seen the output nodes of the numbers. Uh, what are the input nodes? Are those the individual pixels? Those are, yeah. Those are the individual pixels. So if we have an image of 28 by 28, that's 784 pixels, I think. So you would have an input layer of 784. You can choose um, other ideas. You can say, I want to rescale everything, or I might want to have different features as inputs. You can have you can do things like that, um, but this is a very simple example, very naive example, which takes the raw pixels um, and it works. Um, but you, you, people will do other things to perhaps, if they know something about the data they're working with, they might say, I think another feature is more likely to be uh, a factor in the answer, and they might tr use that to train the network instead. So they might use color, uh, they might use alpha values, they might use something else. 
So, um, any other question? Uh, okay, thanks a lot. Uh, it was Thank a great you. talk. All right.